Hello, this is Dr. Sydney LeFay, a consultation liaison psychiatrist here to discuss a critically important topic, the safety of antipsychotics in liver disease. Chronic liver disease is rising for the general population and our patients are particularly vulnerable. As we see more medically complex individuals in clinics and hospitals alike, creating a safe and effective plan for our patients can be daunting. Sometimes we aren't just looking at what the best medication might be, but really what medication is the least risky, knowing that all of the medications carry some risk. In my practice, this is almost a daily dilemma, and I am always delighted to find a review article that lays it out clearly and concisely like this 2023 review from the Academy of Consultation Liaison Psychiatry. The article starts us off by reviewing the pathophysiology of drug-induced liver injury, which is divided into two subtypes, intrinsic and idiosyncratic. Intrinsic injury is a dose-dependent effect and often occurs quickly. Think something like acetaminophen. Idiosyncratic injury is independent of the dose, difficult to anticipate, and can occur over months or years of using a drug. Antipsychotics generally fall in the idiosyncratic category, so we're going to focus on that. We don't know why idiosyncratic injury occurs exactly, but it's probably some combination of genetics, environment, and immune response, and it can be hepatocellular, cholestatic, mixed, or hepatosteatotic in presentation. We cannot reliably predict who will develop any kind of antipsychotic-induced liver injury, but advanced age, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, hepatitis, and polypharmacy probably contribute to that risk. I'd like to flag the risk of hepatosteatosis where cholestatic hepatocellular or mixed injury can be relatively fast in onset, hepatosteatosis is slower and reversible in the early stages. This often occurs in the setting of metabolic syndrome, where elevated triglycerides accumulate in the liver. This is another reason to minimize or manage our metabolic side effects from our drugs. If unchecked, this can progress to cirrhosis and carcinoma. The review highlights one three-year observational study of patients randomly assigned to aripiprazole, risperidone, quetiapine, or zeprazidone. One quarter of participants showed signs of fatty liver disease by the end of the study, though none had developed cirrhosis or overt non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is interesting, but I can't help but notice it did not include our metabolic heavy hitters like olanzapine and clozapine. Looking more broadly at all-cause antipsychotic-induced liver failure, the risk is pretty low. In a massive 13-year observational study of over 300,000 patients, only 0.07% developed clinically significant liver injury with transaminases over five times normal. Now, transaminitis when starting an antipsychotic is quite common. Rates can be as low as 1% with paliperidone or as high as 67% with clozapine. This should be mild and self-correct within days to weeks, but if it persists, worsens, or other signs of liver injury are present, like physical exam findings or elevated bilirubin, this could be more severe, and evaluation with hepatology or in the emergency department is warranted. Remember, while antipsychotics could be the cause, other causes of liver injury need to be considered as well. A broad workup is especially important in our clozapine patients, and I appreciate that this article points that out. Clozapine is one medication we might not want to stop so quickly depending on the risk-benefit analysis. If another cause for liver injury can be found, it might be reassuring to continue or eventually restart the clozapine. In most cases, the potentially offending medication should be stopped while a workup proceeds. In an ideal world, as presented in this paper, liver function would be monitored one to two times per week, then every one to three months until recovery. Once recovered, you can consider reinitiating an antipsychotic with a lower risk profile. Now, I find myself in many non ideal circumstances where the patient's psychosis requires treatment before their liver has recovered. This paper mentions that haloperidol has been used in delirious patients with liver injury for decades, and it's often one of the first choices. Other medications can be considered depending on the patient's symptoms and historical responses to antipsychotics. When treating patients with underlying liver disease, we have to carefully weigh the risks of treatment as liver dysfunction negatively impacts every aspect of the pharmacokinetic process. Selecting more hepatically favorable drugs and using the start low, go slow approach are both reasonable places to start. I am always trying to reduce polypharmacy, but it's particularly crucial when protein binding, excretion, and cytochrome P450 processing are all impaired by liver dysfunction. This paper recommends checking liver function at six weeks and every three months thereafter for the first year of treatment, 
when initiating an antipsychotic in a patient with underlying liver disease. For patients who have been known to experience liver injury from psychiatric medications, more frequent monitoring may be appropriate. If it were me, I'd probably be having a conversation with one of our GI colleagues too. Now for the risk categorization we've all been waiting for. While they looked at a large pool of data between 1946 and 2022, the authors limited their discussion to 15 selected agents and rated them from low to high risk. Low-risk drugs had less than 10 incidents of hepatotoxicity with no liver failure, while high-risk agents had over 50 cases of hepatotoxicity with or without liver failure. As the authors point out, some newer drugs appear to have less hepatotoxicity, but they've also had less time on the market to accumulate reports. In the low-risk category, we have some staples like loxapine, haloperidone, aripiprazole, ziprazidone, and lorazidone. Newer drugs like brexpiprazole, cariprazine, and lumateperone also made this list. The highest risk medication here was chlorpromazine, with clozapine and olanzapine behind it in the moderate to high risk category. In terms of long-acting injectables, there's not much else to go on except what I've already described, though paliperidone is minimally metabolized through the liver, so it's probably your best bet there. So what do we take away here? Well, almost anyone can be at risk of antipsychotic-induced liver injury, and it's really hard to predict. Fortunately, the likelihood of severe injury is pretty low. In cases of acute injury, most of the time, the drug should be stopped and a workup should be started for other causes. We may hesitate to stop clozapine depending on the circumstances. Our patients with known metabolic syndrome are particularly at risk for hepatosteatosis, which can be slow to develop but reversible. So we should keep that in mind as we review our typical surveillance labs. If we're reaching for medications in patients who are high risk or who have existing liver disease, we should consider paliperidone first, along with aripiprazole, ziprazidone, and some of the newer drugs. Where possible, chlorpromazine, olanzapine, and clozapine should be avoided. As we know, pharmacology is in no way a one-fits-all experience. Reviews like this one give us one more lighthouse in a sea of information and help us structure our risk-benefit conversations with our colleagues on the care team and with our patients. No matter what, we can always fall back on that wonderful mantra, start low, go slow.